So Ro Khanna is uh, building bridges and literally getting people in the middle of the country jobs. This is a pretty cool story. Take a look. Well, the last person you'd expect to fight for tech jobs in America's heartland is a congressman representing Silicon Valley. But that is exactly what our friend Ro Khanna of California is doing. And not just talking about it, but actually doing it. Truly positive and practical. And he is here now. Congressman, uh, tell us what you've been working on. Well, Steve, the, we are doing a project with Governor Reynolds in Jefferson, Iowa. Uh, we're going to provide dozens of scholarships for kids to get about 18 months of tech training. Uh, it's a partnership with uh, Accenture, with Facebook, with other tech companies. And at the end of this training, they're going to have jobs, jobs paying between sixty to $70,000. And they get to stay in the communities they love in uh, Jefferson, Iowa, or other uh, western rural Iowa. So that's so important, that point you just made there, because our earlier guest, Chris Arnardi, he's talking about the, the way that so much of uh, the, the kind of the conversation in the last you know, few decades, actually, about the economy has been, well, the economy is changing. It's all becoming this knowledge economy. If your factory closes, tough luck, you've got to move somewhere else and get, go where the jobs are. You're showing that that's not necessary. Do you think this can go beyond? I mean, is, this, is this a demonstration of what can be done? That, and and how, will, how would you like to see this kind of spread to other places? It is. It's, I call it a ripple in a pond. There's no reason that we need 200,000 tech jobs outsourced to places like China or Brazil. We could be doing that in the heartland. And the reality is, Steve, that most people don't want to move. They love the community. They're concerned that their churches are dwindling, that their kids are having to leave. What mm -hmm. we need to do is allow them to preserve their way of life and bring these jobs here. And there are cost advantages to have these jobs uh, not just located in the Bay Area. Uh, and the talent is everywhere. So if we are deliberate, we can make this work. So this particular project, it seems to me, you know, has, has really been, you know, you've, you've driven it, Governor Reynolds has been involved, that kind of personal involvement. What are some of the policy levers or policy changes that you, you'd look at to try and, if you like, institutionalize this, to make it a part of the economy moving forward? A few things. I think we need high-speed, affordable broadband everywhere. We can do that for $40 billion. Mm -hmm. That can be a bipartisan initiative. Second, we ought to have tax incentives to hire workers in these communities. Uh, Quebec has a model uh, similar to that, where they actually provide tax incentives to hire folks in a community. Why don't we have that in rural America? Third, uh, why don't we make sure that if you have a federal software contract, uh, at least 10 percent of your workforce is coming uh, from the rural communities or from communities of color, so that uh, even if 90 percent is coming from Silicon Valley, we're incentivizing companies uh, not to offshore but to hire people in this country. Those are really <laughs> sensible and practical things. I mean, I just think that um, if we just had that pragmatic approach to these things rather than the more it feels to me like the last few decades it's been very ideologically driven you know like we've got this laissez-faire dogma that has driven a lot of policy and you're saying and I think this is what's the interesting alliance you left and right here saying no let's focus on the worker and do things that really make a difference um, are you are you talking to the administration about any of this I have. You know, I've actually uh, talked to Jared Kushner in the White House Office of Innovation and Matt Lira there. These are practical ideas to make sure that America wins the 21st century. We need to make sure that more people have access to technology uh, in a technology revolution and more people are going to have jobs, whether it's in advanced manufacturing, whether it's in ag tech, uh, whether it's in uh, software design. Uh, and the interesting thing here is, Steve, that it is not ideological. Obviously, you need the private yeah. sector. I, I heard your earlier segment. You're absolutely right. You can't just have colleges or high schools that have no clue about what the private sector needs. You need to have practical partnerships with uh -huh. the private sector, but you also need uh, government is strategic investment. And that's what built America, government investment with colleges, universities, and the private sector. Yeah, so that's, that's awesome. This is awesome. This is like real rubber meets the road policy stuff and getting things done. The only thing I'll caution against is you don't, for public-private partnerships, you need to make sure that the terms are reasonable because oftentimes, since our government is so corrupt, they'll come up with these deals where they're just forking over taxpayer money to private companies and the private companies are doing Dickie McGee's acts and uh, they're just pocketing that. So... As long as the terms are clear and as long as it's, you know, it's um, 
there is no wiggle room or room for interpretation or misinterpretation. And the idea is, hey, you're creating X number of jobs, um, then, then I'm totally for it. And what's interesting is that this guy, I think Steve Hilton his name is, uh, he, he fancies himself a right-wing populist. And uh, from what I've seen of him, he's like the only person who actually means it on the right. Um, like he's actually in favor of, of creating policies that benefit working people in this country. So whereas a guy like Donald Trump, I'd argue, and Steve Bannon, they're fundamentally like fake populists where they're more than willing to do the language of populism and, oh, working people are screwed, these, these trade deals are terrible. And then they turn around and they're like, hey, let's do the standard stupid uh, right-wing economics that has gotten us into a freaking depression and a recession. Let's do deregulation. Let's do tax cuts for the rich, so on and so forth. So um, this is awesome. And this is basically like he's talking about almost like a tech new deal kind of thing where you prevent outsourcing of tech jobs and instead you you move those jobs to the middle of the country. And what I would do is he says, Oh, use tax incentives to get them to do it or have a requirement of like 10% of the workforce being in the middle of the country or whatever. I would also do the other approach, which is okay. Tax incentives. If you keep it here, but also it's punitive if you, if you want to outsource the jobs. So we'll make it worth your while to keep them here and we will punish you if they go abroad. And there will be no wiggle room on that either. You're going to be massively incentivized to create the jobs here. Um, and that's really what he's talking about here. And uh, it's wonderful that now there's this, um, you know, you know, in some ways how there's that libertarian progressive alliance on foreign policy. There's a very strange paleoconservative progressive alliance on trade, which is great. That's, that's awesome. So, you know, always... If you're working towards your desired policies, don't hesitate to work with people who even, you know, you would otherwise despise. As long as you're not agreeing on their grounds, then there's no reason not to work it out. And so that's what we're seeing here with the paleocons, so-called populist right, working with the left on keeping jobs in America, disincentivizing outsourcing, and uh, trying to make our country, you know, prosper and thrive. So love this stuff from Rokana, and um, hopefully there's more of this moving forward.